If you'd asked me 10 years ago about Hyundai's progress towards electrification, I would have said it was moving somewhat slowly, arguably slower than some other companies out there like Ford and Toyota. But things are definitely different for 2022. Hyundai has a whole host of hybrid, plug-in hybrid vehicles, and now their third electric car on sale in the US. This is the all-new Ioniq 5. It effectively replaces the first Hyundai electric car on sale, the Ioniq Electric. Quickly following up on this Ioniq 5 should be an Ioniq 6 later this year. That's going to be basically a sedan built on the same dedicated electric vehicle platform. And Hyundai is promising a wide variety of full electric vehicles, including things like three row crossovers and perhaps even pickup trucks. The design of the Ioniq 5 is quite striking and somewhat unusual for an electric vehicle, fairly square and boxy also. Somehow all of that combines to make a vehicle that looks a lot smaller than it is. This is about an inch wider than a Hyundai Tucson and about the same length as well. According to the designers, the inspiration for this vehicle was the 1975 Hyundai Pony. And I suppose if you squint, you could see maybe a little bit of that 1970s car in there. But in reality, this looks to me like what a Volkswagen engineer in the 1980s would have thought a Volkswagen Golf would have looked like in 2022. And that is definitely a compliment because I think this is a very handsome design. And honestly, I've always loved the Golf. I especially love the really square headlights. This definitely looks like it was designed for Minecraft. We have a 360 degree camera system in this vehicle, so there's a centrally mounted camera there. And then under the headlight, we see some very distinctive illuminated little slashes here in this gray section. It's really visible at night. Down at the bottom, we find active aero shutters, but they're not stuck behind a faux grille. We just have this simple slot opening. As we move around the vehicle, you'll definitely notice a lot of these horizontal lines. What makes the deeply cut styling elements really cool is that in some lighting conditions, they will reflect the light and they look almost illuminated. Even from this angle, they look like they're a different color, but that's actually just the angle of them to the camera. Now on the downside, they are a devil to clean. Also a devil to clean are the optional 20 inch wheels. Now these are standard on the limited all wheel drive model that I'm testing today. You will get different wheels depending on the trim you're looking at. Now, although I'm not the biggest fan of black wheels, I have to say I love the tires that they are wrapped in because these are 255 with tires. These are quite wide for a mainstream electric vehicle. A Mustang Mach-E, for instance, has 225 tires on all trims except the GT, and that bumps things up to 245. Those are still narrower than the ones that we find on here. Outside of a luxury branded EV like a Tesla Model Y, you'd be hard pressed to find tires that are this wide and consequently handling and braking scores that are as good as the Ionic 5s. Hyundai puts the charge door right back here. It is a push door. There's actually a little button in there that gets pushed when you push on that little indication. And then inside we find the standard J1772 charging connector and the CCSDC fast charge port. It's interesting how Hyundai often goes for elegant solutions. You'll see this button here is the close button and then there's a little nub right there on the door itself. So when the door is closed and we press this little checkerboard section right there, it's actually pressing on that button to open the door. This is the charge port. Then we have a little pull out thing for the DC fast charge connector. I kind of wish this had been a door rather than this floppy component because that does end up bopping your paint a little. I think the reason the Ionic 5 looks smaller than it is is because this has an incredibly long wheelbase. The distance between the front wheels and the rear wheels is longer than the three row Hyundai Palisade. And that's what again gives this that sort of grown up Volkswagen Golf look. Also, the roof line is a little bit lower than you might think, and that's part of why this looks smaller than a Hyundai Tucson, even though it's a little bit wider and actually a little bit longer as well. The roof line is nearly three inches closer to the ground. Then for aero purposes, the rear end also tapers up a little bit. Obviously, we have the electric motor under there, and then we have a little bit more of a raked profile to the rear window. If you get the model without the power handles, I personally find a bit of a functional problem with this handle. You can see you have to push it in right over there to pull it out. And unless you're gonna two hand this, you end up either wanting to open it with your right hand and your thumb or your left hand, which is a little bit awkward when you're gonna try and enter that side. Be sure and let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section below. I think the easy solution to that is to buy the top end trim and just get the power handles. The retro theme continues out back with this multi-module LED taillight element. Unfortunately, the turn signals are not amber, they are red. This little silver trim mirrors what's going on up front, but sadly, there are no illuminated slashes in the back. I think that would have been a really cool touch. We have more of those slashes right here in the lower portion of the bumper, also a little bit tricky to keep clean. And this entire section opens as the hatch. There's a button right there in the middle, so you can see these lamp elements stay in place while the rest of the hatch opens. 
Some EV fans are disappointed by this, but the Ionic 5 is built on a dedicated EV platform, and that EV platform was designed from the ground up to build EVs without a front trunk. Under here we find a small storage area. It's kind of a pizza box sized thing. We have enough room here to put the EVSE, which is included with the Hyundai, not included with the Kia. So if you're debating between the two, keep this particular twist in mind. You can also put your Tesla tap and other items right there. The small storage area was simply a Hyundai design choice with this vehicle. They could have made the front end longer and given us a front trunk. They simply chose not to. But you will notice that the distance between the front bumper and the dashboard and the firewall in the vehicle is much shorter than in something like a Mach-E or the Tesla Model S that we had in for review earlier this week. That is where the room for a front trunk comes from. Well, we're under here, we should talk about the drivetrain. The Ionic 5 is available as a single motor EV or a dual motor EV in three different power levels with two different battery packs. Outside of North America, there's another battery pack, but it's not making it to the US just yet. The standard range model coming a little bit later this year, not currently available, but somewhere on the boat to America, is gonna be a 168 horsepower rear wheel drive model with a 58 kilowatt hour battery pack. According to the EPA, that model should give you 220 miles of range. If you want over 300 miles of range, you want this battery pack. It's a 77.4 kilowatt hour unit, and it's mated to a bigger electric motor in the back, good for 225 horsepower. If you want all wheel drive, then you want this exact model, same battery pack, same electric motor in the rear with a slightly less powerful electric motor up front, giving you 320 horsepower total. Much like we see in luxury EVs or of course the Mach-E, this has a strong rear power bias even in the dual motor models. This is not a symmetrical layout like we find in the new Subaru and Toyota EVs or of course the Polestar and Volvo EVs. If you choose all-wheel drive in your Ionic 5, range will drop down to 256 miles. That is definitely lower than the related EV6, mainly because this is boxier and a bit bigger on the inside. Charging is the Ionic 5's real party trick, and I'm not talking about the onboard 10.9 kW level 2 charger. That's pretty typical for a modern EV. I'm talking about the average sustained charge rates from 10% to 80%. This will peak at 236 kW, but it maintains over 150 kilowatt charge rates for quite a long time. And that's what enables this battery to go from 10% to 80% in just 18 minutes. Obviously, climactic conditions will cause your charge times to vary up or down. Earlier today, I was actually able to beat that time. I went from 7% to 80% in 18 minutes because this was really blazing along quite rapidly. If you live in a really cold climate, you're gonna to need to do some self preconditioning of the battery to try and get some of those higher charge rates. Otherwise, at the beginning of your charge cycle, the charge rates may be severely limited down to about 60 or 70 kilowatts rather than the peak of 236 that you can maintain in warmer weather. Now, what do I mean by warmer weather? Well, in 40 or 50 degree weather, you should be just fine as long as the battery has warmed up a bit. But if you are traveling through snow, ice, and it's under 30 degrees, well, then your charge times may take just a little bit longer. The obvious solution to colder weather charging speeds would be battery preconditioning. That is not a feature we have directly on the Ionic 5 just yet in the US, but the rumor mill says it may be coming at some point in the future. Hyundai, of course, will not comment officially on that, but that could solve that problem in colder weather. Speaking of colder weather, if you live in an area that routinely gets temperatures below about 40 degrees, whether or not you get snow, you're going to want the all-wheel drive model. Not necessarily for the front electric motor, but because that's how you get a heat pump in the Ionic 5. The rear-wheel drive model on the other hand use a more traditional resistive element heater to heat the cabin and that's going to consume considerably more energy than the heat pump unit. So again, even if you live in an area that doesn't routinely get snow but temperatures drop below about 40 to 45 degrees, you should definitely consider the all-wheel drive model. Depending on your environment, you actually may get longer range in the all-wheel drive model than the rear-wheel drive model when you're using the heater. And if you live in a really cold area, Hyundai has confirmed that the heat pump is backed up by a resistive element heater. In my 24 inch roller bag test, I was able to squeeze four 24 inch roller bags back here. That is definitely a few less than you'll get in a Tucson, but still a pretty good performance. You can see these 22 inch bags have no problem fitting back here. Under the load floor, there is some additional storage space, but rather unusually, the subwoofer for the Bose audio system is right here in the middle. It would have been considerably more practical if they'd put the subwoofer back there in the corner or something because we do have some additional storage space. It's just not overly usable because of that subwoofer right in the middle of everything. That location may have something to do with the long wheelbase in the Ionic 5 because if we look at the EV6, which has a shorter wheelbase, you'll notice that the subwoofer is actually under this plastic panel, giving us a more flat load area there under the floor. 
During the four and a half hour road trip that I spent range testing this vehicle, I found the driver's seat to be very comfortable. We have a two way adjustable lumbar support. And instead of an extending thigh cushion, we find this power ottoman, which rather interestingly, you can extend into this position while you're driving the vehicle. The main purpose for the ottoman, of course, is to enable the max relaxation mode for this front seat. So that way, if you're DC fast charging, you can take a little nap. The ottoman never goes exactly horizontal, but you can see it definitely has a very reclined nature to it. It's pretty comfortable as far as taking a nap, although it seems a little bit less useful when DC fast charge rates are so quick in this vehicle. Interior roominess is definitely a reason to buy this over the related EV6, especially if you're looking for front seat headroom and rear seat headroom. Leaning back here, I have about half an inch of headroom left. This does have the large panoramic glass moonroof, but as you'll see in a bit, it doesn't actually improve rear seat headroom. But the front seats have considerably more headroom than you'll find in the front seats of the EV6 with its optional sunroof. Moving over to the middle, definitely plenty of legroom here. Moving all the way over to the right with this front seat all the way back in its tracks, I still have about four inches of legroom left. There's definitely enough room here for rear facing child seats, even if you're a taller driver up front, because this has well over 80 inches of combined legroom. Interestingly, that gives the Ionic 5 more combined legroom than we find in the Tesla Model S. The biggest difference between the Ionic 5 and the EV6 in the rear compartment is going to be the distance between your head and the side of the ceiling right here. The greenhouse really cuts in towards the rear in the EV6, and that means that if you're sitting in the rear seat like I would be here, then the ceiling feels like it's practically next to your ear. Rear seat passengers get two USB charge only ports in the center console. No air vents there because they're over here on the side. And then this model gets very well integrated window shades for the rear passengers as well. As we look around the Ionics interior, keep in mind this is the top end limited trim. We get this large panoramic moonroof here, but it does not open and it does not really improve headroom because as you can see, it has this roller style shade. Now, I do think this is a good compromise because even though it doesn't increase headroom like we find in the glass roofs in a Tesla or a Mach-E, it does have the effect of giving you this open and airy cabin while also allowing you to completely shut it. The reason it doesn't affect headroom in the rear is because the glass opening doesn't go quite far enough back. And the reason it doesn't affect headroom up front is because these side portions come in a little bit close to the middle of the vehicle. So it does end up hitting your head if you're taller. We have high adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger and multi-way adjustable headrests. One odd thing about the headrest, however, is that only the driver is moves forward and backward. The passengers just moves up and down. From this angle, you can see the integrated window shades back there in the rear seat area and some of the ambient lighting there inside that armrest area. You can see it has a really attractive look at night. The front doors are made from a majority of soft touch material. So the entire upper section is soft touch as is that armrest down there. Then we find harder plastics at the bottom. Moving back up to the dashboard, we have a lot of horizontal theme going on here, but only one air vent on the passenger side. Soft touch materials up top, harder plastics down lower, and then a very, very large glove compartment. This is a bin and slot style glove compartment, so a little bit different than we find in other EVs. And what really surprises me about this is how deep this is. You can fit a 15 inch laptop in there if you wanted to. And somehow that's all packaged in a fairly slim dashboard, whereas in something like the BZ4X and Solterra, we don't have a glove box at all. Moving to the middle of the dashboard, we have a large 12.3 inch infotainment system and a 12.3 inch instrument cluster housed in this single large white expanse. It really gives this a very dramatic look. Below that, we have two large air vents and then controls for the climate control system here. We have a few more physical buttons than we find in the EV6, but one oddity here I noticed is that if you wanna heat or ventilate the seats, you have to hit this climate button then you interact with the climate control options up here in the infotainment system. As you'd expect, the infotainment system offers Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration, and it occupies the entire screen. There are a few EV specific screens, but not too many here. This shows you the distance and it will dynamically update based on the drive mode. So if I go over into sport mode, it'll get a little bit longer. If I go over to eco mode, it will go a little bit further because of that front axle disconnect feature. In here is also where we can change the EV charge transfer or vehicle to load. So you can choose when you want the vehicle to load to stop transferring to the load. So that'll reserve that amount of battery capacity so that way you can make sure you get somewhere. You can also scheduling uh, charging and you can schedule the climate control to turn on. This screen will give you your nearest charging station there. But one thing worth noting is that this navigation system, if I go over to the map and the navigation system here, this will not actually schedule charging for you. So for instance, if I type in a destination that I know is gonna be too far away, like Los Angeles International Airport, and then set as destination, it will tell me that I have insufficient charge to reach the destination and I can search stations along the route, but it's not gonna automatically add them to the route and it's not going to do any sort of prioritization of stations. It's not gonna tell me 
the status of stations, whether they're available, how many connectors are available, the price of them, anything along those lines, like some EVs out there will. And it kind of does some silly things here. So like, it, I don't need to charge right now, and I certainly don't need to charge a level two charging station. I know that one is a three kilowatt station. So not all these charging recommendations are really very useful at all. One thing that I like, however, is the fact that we have an on-off button for the vehicle that at least makes it easier to photograph for me. Down here at the bottom, we find the USB interface for the infotainment system. It's worth noting that we don't have wireless CarPlay here. I do think that's kind of an odd location for that USB port because you can see the cable kind of stretches around there in the foot area. It just doesn't seem as clean as it could be. Small storage cubby right there. We then have a sliding center console here that moves forward and backward. Two large cup holders there, lots of storage in here other USB ports, but these are charge only ports in here. There's also a Qi wireless charging mat, lots of additional storage space. You're going to put tablet computers, cables, that sort of thing. Then we have an armrest and even more storage just under the armrest. The gear selector is on a stock. You can see it's hanging out just under the windshield wiper stock right there. We put our foot on the brake pedal and then rotate forward for drive. We rotate backwards for reverse. Park is that button right there. We have new stocks versus what we see in other Hyundai models and definitely a very distinctive steering wheel. This has a flat bottom design, sport grips up top, and illuminated buttons on the front. These button modules are a combination of a physical element and touch functionality, so it knows which button you pressed by your touch, but the module itself actually moves to give you haptic feedback. We also find volume up down, track forward backward, a drive mode button here that cycles through the various drive modes, and you can see the theme of that instrument cluster also changes as you toggle through those modes. And over here on this side, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, the highway driving assistant, aggressive lane centering, and then a button to interact with that multifunction LCD. To the left of the instrument cluster, we find a small fabric section. This has a metal backing so you could put magnets on there. I'm not entirely clear why you would want to do that, but you can use that as a small magnetic bulletin board in your car. Let me know if you at all would be interested in that particular function. Get behind the wheel of the Ionic 5 and you're going to notice two things right away. The first thing is the acceleration. This is shockingly fast. I recorded 0 to 60 in 4.4 seconds. That is nearly as fast as some very expensive BMWs. It's really interesting that electrification has sort of leveled the playing field here and a lot of 0 to 60 acceleration times in an electric vehicle isn't about the raw horsepower number. It's about how quickly the manufacturer wants to ramp power to the electric motors, how quickly that torque curve builds. And instead of going in the direction that, say, Volkswagen did with the Volkswagen ID4, Hyundai went more in the same direction as Tesla. This has a very punchy feel to it, even in the normal drive mode, and that is definitely taken up to the next level if you put this in the sport mode where the throttle is remapped and also the torque curve is remapped a little bit. Also a little bit interesting, if I put this in the eco mode, zero to 60 time is definitely a lot slower. And that's because under most traction situations, the front motor is completely removed from the equation. Now it's not disabled all the time. When you're launching from a standstill, the front electric motor is used for just a short time to help give you extra traction. And if there is a loss of traction on the rear axle, it's going to include the front axle. Eco mode is not a total lockout of the front electric motor, however, it will re-engage in certain situations. For instance, when you're at a stop and you accelerate, even if you're accelerating moderately, it's going to engage the front electric motor to help give you better traction, and then it's going to turn it off pretty quickly. If you're going downhill or uphill and the vehicle senses there might be a traction issue, it's also going to re-engage that front electric motor. Also, if the traction control or stability control system engages, then it's going to re-engage the front motor as well. But in most driving situations like I'm driving right now, the front electric motor is not part of the equation if I'm in eco mode. Of course, if you want the extra power, you can move over to normal mode. The other time the vehicle will re-engage the front electric motor is at higher vehicle speeds in order to enable those higher vehicle speeds. So at around 85 to 90 miles an hour or so, the front electric motor is going to come back on. Now, when it comes to stopping the vehicle, we have reasonable brakes up front and a lot of adjustability for the regenerative braking. Actual stopping distances from 60 miles an hour to zero came in at 120 feet, which is a little bit on the long side for a regular crossover, but right in line with most of the electric competition. There are a very few number of EVs that will stop shorter than this, but certainly not going to be anything priced like this. And you can thank the 255 with tires on this model for that excellent braking score. Before we go on to handling though, which is also improved by those wide tires, we should talk about the regenerative braking. We have paddles in the back of the steering wheel, which I love. I think this is the best way to control regen braking in a vehicle. And I'm specifically talking about throttle lift off regeneration. These are two separate constructs. It's important to keep that in mind. 
total regenerative ability into the battery is dictated by the blended braking system in this vehicle. So even if you have this on level three for liftoff regeneration, there's still some extra regen available if you press on the brake pedal. That means that the driving nature of this is gonna be very different than say a modern Tesla, where you don't have as much control over that throttle liftoff regen because that's all you get in those models. There is no blended braking system. Now, speaking of blended braking, one weird thing here that I noticed is if you're in the zero mode, so no throttle liftoff regen, you also don't get any blended braking. I really don't understand that particular choice. If you're a fan of coasting modes like I am, you should definitely keep that in mind. And you might wanna use the auto mode where the vehicle will automatically decide how much throttle liftoff regen to give you based on the terrain around you and the traffic around you. It uses all the sensors in the vehicle, primarily the radar sensor, to determine when it should coast and when it should not coast. So right now it's in auto mode. It's basically coasting down the road here. If the road started to go down in elevation, then it would start to engage a little bit more regen braking. When it comes to handling ability, the combination of the wide tires and the light curb weight definitely help out the Ionic 5. The light curb weight also enabled them to give this a suspension that is not tuned as harshly, I would say, as the Mustang Mach-E or the Tesla Model Y or something like a Polestar 2. Those are all definitely quite firm. This, on the other hand, feels a little bit more like the average mainstream vehicle, only it handles better than any Hyundai really that I have driven lately. This handles incredibly well. Outside an Elantra N or a Kona N, something like that, this is probably the best handling vehicle in the Hyundai lineup. You will definitely notice that when the road starts winding, it is easy to throw this into a corner. It has a really nice weight balance. This is basically a perfect 50-50 weight balance here. And thanks to the rear electric motor being more powerful than the front electric motor, it always has a strong rear power bias. You'll really feel that out on winding roads like this where you can really push the Ionic 5 harder than you might think it should be pushed. But it performs incredibly well because it's really not that high off the ground. It's not as high off the ground as a Hyundai Tucson, for instance. It has a very low center of gravity. And then of course we have those wide tires as well. But in a way really more interesting to me is the decision by Hyundai to make this a rear wheel drive biased vehicle. If you get the single motor version, it is rear wheel drive only. If you get the dual motor version, there's a lot more power on the back than there is on the front. And that's definitely different than we find in a number of EVs, from mainstream companies like Toyota and Subaru, to even luxury companies like Lexus and Volvo and Polestar. The result is definitely a different feel out on a road like this versus something like the Mustang Mach-E, because in the Mach-E, sometimes the motors will write checks that the tires just can't cash. It has fairly skinny tires, it's definitely heavier than this, and it just is not as willing to dance out on a road like this. I also think that the steering is very well coordinated in the Ionic 5. The ride here appears to be just a hair softer than the Kia EV6, but honestly, the two vehicles are very, very similarly tuned. And when it comes to ride quality, I would pick either of these over the bulk of the competition because you can tell this road is not very well paved. There is definitely a decent amount of body roll, definitely some tip and dive compared to some of the other EVs, but the level of grip is not really affected by that and the ride quality is just superb. Hyundai also did a good job with sound isolation. In my testing, I got 70 and a half decibels at 50 miles an hour, putting this right in the thick of things for most EVs versus a lot of compact crossovers that you might be cross shopping with the Ionic 5 or subcompact or compact hatches as well, this is definitely going to be quieter. And the battery pack is a big reason for that. There's definitely more isolation because there's more mass between the road and the cabin that definitely leads to more isolation. Now, speaking of that battery, how far will it take you on a charge? Well, that really depends on where you're going and how you're driving. In my real world range test, which I have recently decided to rename the Alex on Auto's road trip range test over the course of that 225 mile run where I ended up down at 7% battery and could not complete my drive loop, which is ostensibly 247 miles. This vehicle would not have actually completed it. I averaged just a hair under 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour. So this is definitely less efficient efficient than the EV6, which is related, but this is more practical, so keep that in mind. The boxier shape back there that gives us more headroom, more shoulder room, more room to the side of your head, and more cargo room doesn't come for free. The cost is range and efficiency. 
If you drive slower than I do, you're gonna get closer to that window sticker number. If you drive faster than I do, or you're using the climate control heavily, say in really cold weather, you should expect to get range that's a little bit lower. Also keep in mind that my highway driving portion of that test goes up and over an 1800 foot mountain pass. So there is some elevation on that testing. I think that's very real world because not everybody lives in Kansas. So a lot of road trips are going to involve going up and over hills, driving on country roads, driving on freeways, etc. So I think that my test is very realistic. And either way you slice it, this is actually a reasonably good showing. On your daily commute where you're gonna be spending a little bit more time in stop and go traffic, perhaps a little bit more time in city driving, this should be closer to the EPA window sticker. On the other hand, I am gonna give this a B when it comes to fuel economy because there are a reasonable number of EVs that will get 3.5 to 3.6 miles per kilowatt hour on that exact same test cycle. Even after a week behind the wheel, the Ionic 5 continues to impress. But the real trump card for this vehicle has to be the fast DC fast charge time. Because even if you don't get 250 miles on a road trip with this vehicle, it can charge so quickly that it honestly does not matter. Because on my road trip loop, which is again about 246, 247 miles, this did need to DC fast charge, but it only needed to DC fast charge for five minutes connected to the charger to give me enough to get back to the office to plug it into my own charger there and have a 40 mile buffer to make sure that if something went wrong, I wouldn't need to stop again. Now you should know that if you live in a colder area where you turn off the winter mode that's available in the infotainment system, your charge times may take longer, but you always have the option of speeding things up by preconditioning the battery manually. And here's how you do that in a vehicle like this that doesn't have a preconditioned mode. You basically put this in the most aggressive regeneration mode and you floor it and then you brake and then you floor it and then you brake and then you floor it and then you brake. You, you do that for a while, the battery is going to heat up and then you can go to the DC fast charge station and get that peak charge rate. In order to keep the YouTube algorithm happy, you'll now find pricing and comparisons in a second video. Just watch this all the way to the end, hit the pricing and comparison button on the lower right hand side of your screen. In the meantime, be sure to hit the subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen as well if you haven't already done so. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other social places, and we'll see you over there in part two.